of getting started. Okay, so in this lecture, um, well, as it says, Isabel theory, so I obviously, I mainly focused on Isabel, but I will again be trying to give you some uh, remarks that apply to other systems. And we will see um, a complete but very simple Isabel theory, trying to show off all the things that you can put in one, which basically has everything to do with putting in specifications and then proving theorems about them. Well, this clever gadget doesn't work, so I'll get rid of it. Do it the old-fashioned way. Um, so, what are these so-called theories? Um, they're not what you might think of in the logic world where theory is a mathematical object, which is basically a collection of um, theorems closed under inference. But if you like, it is somehow connected. So, as I said last time, a interactive theorem prover is really a specification editor, and these theories are the specifications you're editing. So you introduce types and constants and functions, uh, all sorts of other things that you can then use to describe the system um, that you are trying to verify or the properties that it should be satisfying. Now, there's the question of axioms. So, I remember, we're doing logic. Okay, we're doing verification, but we're doing verification using logic. And, in fact, just about every one of these systems allows you to introduce your own axioms, um, which could be anything. I see a question. Oh, fuck. Um, thank you. And, guys, don't be here. Look, I set up nearly everything perfectly, right? Except for the one tiny thing. Um, wait, the projector should be on. Oh, there we go. Uh, I set up almost everything perfectly, and then you complain about a little thing like not having the projectors on. I, I do find that unreasonable. Um, are you coming up? I think we're getting there. Yeah. Still taking its time. And why are they not actually showing what I've got here? I think they just have to warm up first. God, that's slow. Well, the, the weird thing, of course, is kind of in the past, when we had normal lectures in this room, everything would be on and warmed up long ago. That's better. OK, uh, back to what I was saying. In all these systems, you can put in your own axioms. And you might think, I'm clever. We're all clever. We would never put in an axiom like 1 equals 0. And yet, um, experience shows that by the time you put in 12 axioms, you have got contradictions somewhere. It just seems to happen. It is really incredibly difficult to list a bunch of axioms without having a contradiction somewhere. So somewhere during, I guess, the 1980s, the idea developed that you should never, ever use axioms. That kind of goes too far the other way. But what we tend to do much more is create what we, well, what we call specifications, which are descriptions of properties, which are not at least not axioms at the top level. Now note um, a if you like, an encapsulated specification of stuff you want could in itself be inconsistent, which means that there is nothing actually realizing the specification you've asked for. Uh, and obviously that's bad, but it's not as bad as having axioms at the top level that are inconsistent. If you like, it is the difference between having a program crash and having your operating system crash, right? Okay. So we, we will generally avoid using axioms. Um, what do you do with your theory? Well, it is impressive how general purpose these systems are. So uh, thinking back to the original Hall system, which was one of the first that was really useful, um, it was first used to verify a very simple abstract computer, and then other chips, and then more chips. But then people broke away from hardware, and soon they were talking about 
um, things like numerical algorithms, and then they're going to mathematics in general, and finally they were going to just about anything that you could do in logic they were doing using, in this case, Gordon's Hall system. Um, and the same can be said of other systems like Koch. It's harder, I'm not being snarky here, I can be very snarky, but uh, quite seriously, in the case of Koch, I'm not quite sure what the original intent was. I think it was that they had invented this amazing little formal calculus, and I just wanted to see what it could do. So if you like, it was curiosity-driven science, um, which they, in fact, pushed more in a mathematical direction at first before trying to push it more in an applied direction, which, after all, is where all the money is. Okay. So... And here I have a teeny tiny theory file. Uh, this, of course, now we're getting to Isabel. Um, and you can see the sorts of things we do. So you give it a name. You list things it is built on. Now, if you're doing a hull development, you will just about always import main, which is like, says what it is. Um, but there are lots and lots of other kind of more elaborate libraries that you could build on if you're doing a more advanced development. And you can, of course, have more than one. The idea is they are all brought in together. You, they, you then declare things. Now, what you see here, now again, if you know Haskell or ML or something, you'll recognize that as a kind of recursive type declaration. So you can declare things like that. And then again, uh, sorry, uh, let me go back. So there's your type. And just below the type declaration there is what looks like a bit of recursive function definition. Now we're not, okay, we are in logic. So although we can specify things in logic by giving effectively a computation, or if you like, by giving an implementation, um, our logic is not a programming language. So we can talk about programming, as you can see there, but the logic itself is not a programming language, and you can write lots of things that are not executable at all. Uh, I just feel it is a bit maybe more intuitive for computer scientists to begin with executable things. So there we have defined a data type and a function. This is, and by the way, what does this do? Uh, the data type is um, binary branching, binary trees, and if any of you did the tripos here, any of you did the tripos here? Okay, have you seen enough binary trees to make yourself sick, at least in the first year? Um, you know, binary branching trees like that, and this function reflect is just doing the obvious act of reflecting a binary tree on itself. And the theorem here that we are now trying to prove is that if you take a tree and reflect it on itself twice, you get back to where you started. And you also see there the little actual proof. So the first line of that is the statement to be proved, and then where it says apply and so on, um, you're telling Isabel how to prove it. Um, so what have we got here? And these principles, now again, I, I try to make some things relevant to other systems. Just about every system I can think of allows you to impor import a combination of other theories to make a new one. Kind of like in programming where you import other modules. Uh, maybe issues with name clashes which maybe will be resolved in one way or another depending on the system. Uh, we have declare before use. Again, in, in all systems I'm aware of, and it's kind of obvious that if you allow things to be used before you declare them, then you could get into a lot of trouble, and especially you could get into circular definitions. But generally, we don't impose any order on uh, in which things have to be declared. Uh, you could imagine something like all constants to be declared first, but that is, I don't know of any system that does that. Incidentally, okay, yes, we're about Isabel, uh, and you saw on the previous slide, you had some nice looking syntax with nice keywords like theory and imports and so on. Um, a lot of the early systems, such as the original Hall system, you only had the ML top level. So when you are talking 
to your hall system. In fact, you're just sitting in ML itself. And if you want, you could fool around with ML and you could define, I don't know, a factorial function or make something to solve the eight queens problem all in ML and then suddenly declare a recursive data type using the hall system. And that's because with hall, you just have all this stuff that is the code of the hall system loaded on top of the ML uh, of the ML system, but then you're sitting at the ML command line and you can do anything you like. So if you want to suddenly create a theory in the middle of what you're doing, you could, there were basically uh, the facilities in Hall 4 to do things like import theories, declare constants, declare types, or declare recursive functions were all something that you could call from ML, so we just use ML syntax to say, import this, import that, declare this. Um, and it's a universal solution. Uh, it is kind of ugly, and you kind of get the feeling that you're working with a prototype. But it's, if you like, that is the whole vibe. Just about every other system gives you some sort of pretty syntax like you saw in the previous slide, so that you're, you know that you're actually working with the theory, and you couldn't just sort of throw in random code just like that. Um, I interrupted my spiel in the middle. Uh, this is an Isabel thing that you have the ability to nest, nest stuff. Um, and finally, so the idea of when you finish a theory varies from one system to another. Um, in some systems like Hall, it's actually part of a state. So you keep in bringing stuff into your session, and if you want to work in another theory, you have to actually quit your session and start up a fresh session and load in the, the stuff you want. Um, whereas in other systems, in particular in Isabel, you can switch from one theory to another and it knows where you are. Uh, but you have to have, to finish a theory, at least in Isabel, you just stick end at the end and then it is in a state fit to be imported. Okay, now I want to look at the kinds of things we can declare. And this is a slightly weird slide because, for example, the top line I show you a thing called type decal, which is almost never used. So if you forget about it, it won't do you any harm. We have one lecture in which it's used. This is when you want to introduce a type about which you know absolutely nothing. So, there is a type decal, there, there's a type called loc, and this type, a um, bit tricky actually, because if you know nothing about it at all, you might find yourself being forced to make assert some properties about it by sticking in axioms, and we don't like axioms. So you might prefer to use the next thing there called type synonym, in which you're introducing a new type name, but you're just saying in this next line here, uh, val equals nat. So I want to have a type called val, and I'm too lazy to, well, let's just say, I just want val to be the natural numbers, but I want to pretend that maybe in the future I could extend it with other notions of value. But at the moment, it just is the natural numbers, and, I, and I'm just creating a synonym. It's kind of not so satisfactory because Isabel will regard those two types as exactly the same, um, which is not necessarily that intuitive. But anyway, you can do it. And as you see here, I have four type synonyms declared one after another, um, and you can use them. Uh, I should go through my wonderful build. So this, we're introducing a type, a basic type. Um, there are type synonyms. And the last line here, this is a recursive data type. Um, I should mention that in higher order logic, which is where we are for this course, recursive types are not primitive to the logic itself. So when you type a command like that, you're asking Isabel to do an enormous amount of work inside to transform your specification of this recursive thing into something that makes sense in logic. It actually does some very sophisticated thing and makes some definitions which I have no idea what they are. I used to know what the earlier version of the data type package did, 
but they have now gone to this very sophisticated, oh God, what is it? something about something functors, bounded natural functors, that's right, please don't ask me what they are. So uh, what I'm trying to say simply is that recursion is not part of the calculus itself in Hull, it is provided by the system going through an elaborate mechanism that then go through that proof kernel I mentioned last time. If, on the other hand, you use a type theory system like Koch or Lean, uh, recursion is built into the calculus itself, so they take a very different attitude to what a logic looks like. Okay, uh, this last point is really for people who, shall we say, is not something you really need to know, but it's nice to know that if you do want to introduce a fancy syntax for things that you've defined yourself, you can. And this is why I mentioned last time there were some little quirks with parsing, and the reason we have these quirks is because we have a very powerful parser at our uh, disposal, and we can introduce like mix-fix syntax where instead of writing this function cond, I can write if-then-else, and the parser will figure out what we want. Um, comments? My slide is out of date. If you type that, it won't actually work. Uh, I'm sorry about that. You can write com comments very similar to that. It's in the documentation somewhere. Um, I need to look that up, so I'm sorry about that. I should have fixed that this summer, but stuff happened, as we all know. Anyway, I said this already. These type synonyms don't really do anything you couldn't do before. The new, t the new type and the old type exactly uh, synonymous. Ah, I didn't say this. Um, if you're used to ML or Haskell, you know perhaps that you can type anything that is syntactically correct in a recursive type definition and it will be accepted. You may find it very hard to do anything with what you have just defined and you might find it impossible even to express a member of the type you have just defined because you can define like a type T which is equal to T arrow T um, which is cool it's a kind of gives you a model of the lambda calculus um, but if you try to do that in logic you would get a contradiction and what will happen instead if you try and do this kind of recursion in the wrong place, you will find just an error message. And the reason you would get an error message, if you could, if such a thing could be defined, um, it would literally, it would have contradictory properties and then the whole world would fall apart. So it is caught somewhere um, in the system. Um, this last point you see on the slide about mutual recursive definitions, you all know what that means, right? So if I define, let's say, terms and formulas, terms can involve formulas and formulas can involve terms, that's mutual recursion. It can be done, but you get this kind of messy thing. You're probably better off formalizing your syntax in another way. For example, with a notion of formula that takes a type operand and then you can have a recursion going through that. Okay, um, this last thing, recursive types, if you define a recursive data type like binary tree, then you gain the ability to express recursion and case analysis on a binary tree. That means clearly recursion over a tree means I can test whether it's a null tree, and if not, I have two subtrees and I can look at those recursively. And case analysis is simply I can tell which of those situations I am in. <coughs> we'll see, of course, many examples of these, so if it's a very abstract uh, definition, uh, sorry, let me just continue. Excuse me, I'm a bit out of sorts today. Um, no, I'm not sick. No one can cough. Um, so going on, and now we're seeing an actual screen um, and an actual, and now we're looking at an actual theory file as it will appear on your computer. Um, anyone downloaded Isabel yet? So it should be quite easy. 
And this user interface was designed, well, not to be like Microsoft Word exactly. Actually, Macarius Wenzel, who designed all this, absolutely hates Microsoft. But nevertheless, the idea of a document that you look at and edit before your eyes is very much part of this. So here we th see a theory file being edited, and it's got an error in it right there where something is underlined in red. So the whole thing that you're looking at has been processed by Isabel, including the bad bits with errors. And where there's an error, there are various ways of looking at the error, but one way is to look at the, um, if you see where it says output there at the bottom. So there are multiple panels that you can select. And if you click on the output panel, you can see the error messages. There are, in fact, other ways, like if you hover the mouse over the red line in exactly the right place, it will give you a little pop-up with the same error message. And the error here, funny, this is, I think, the very error discovered by Mike Gordon long ago when he realized that you have to check definitions. See, we would like to define, or if you look, actually, let me go back to the top. If I define the function square as square of n equals n times n, I hope that's straightforward what that means. I'm introducing a new function called square, and it is defined to be equal to n times n. OK, fine. Um, and I'm even defining it just on the natural numbers, so I'm even getting out of any issues to do with overloading. Although, in fact, if I took out that type constraint, you could define a square function that works for all types for which the asterisk is meaningful, and it would actually work perfectly well. When we get to the next line, now you know what the definition of a prime number is, but this has got an error, and the reason it's got an error is because you see the variable m on the right-hand side is free in the right-hand side, which means that you have a so-called definition that has more variables on the right than on the left. Uh, if, now remember, a, a definition, when you put this in, this is accepted as effectively as an axiom by the theorem prover. Now, I just said we don't like axioms, but we do like axioms as long as they have been checked that they can't introduce any inconsistencies. And a properly formed definition is, in fact, conservative in that way. So that if you look at the following line, the, new, the, the second definition of prime, which has a for all m there, that version is correct, but the one above now, please don't ask me to do it right now, because I am not clever enough. But the one above, uh, if you accepted that uh, as an, a definition of prime, and actually said you had this logical equivalence, you can derive 1 equals 0, because you can put in different values of, of m there. Um, so I'll leave that as an exercise. I don't even think it's stupendously difficult. OK, so you can define constants. These are non-recursive. Um, as it will say, let me, let me just go to my next slide where I'm saying this. Not recursive. We do have recursive function definitions. You've seen one already, but they are not basic constant definitions. They are built on top, as I kind of hinted before. Um, I said this as well. The variables on the right must also all appear on the left. Now here, this last point about expanding definitions is quite important in how you use the system. And maybe some of you will have in a previous course had to prove some theorems in mathematics, maybe yourself. Um, maybe you made the same mistake as I used to make quite a lot, which is the text defines a bunch of things, and then it says, prove this theorem. And one's natural instinct is to expand all the things that were just defined and then try and simplify the mess you get. Um, this often doesn't work, simply because if you expand all your definitions, it blows up exponentially, and pretty soon you are just crushed by the weight of symbols. So when, of course, sometimes you have to expand a definition. Um, but it needs to be limited. So the way it works in, I think, most of these systems, not all, the ones where it doesn't actually have been unsuccessful, but in most sensible systems, when you define things like prime on the previous slide, 
And you then state for yourself a theorem involving the symbol prime. It is left by itself as a single symbol, and if you want to expand it out into that big formula, you actually have to ask your system to expand it out, and then you work with the bigger formula. And if you think about it for just a moment, there are zillions of theorems in the world of mathematics that begin with the assumption that P is a prime number, and if you expand out every one of those things, you'd have a gigantic thing before you even started. Um, what is the bottom line here? Abbreviations. So an abbreviation is the same thing as a definition, except the thing you're defining is so incredibly simple that you do want to expand it out all the time. So, and these are actually quite rare. Okay, time for a Dilbert. Look at the eyes and see, they can't cope with him. Anyway, so let's do an example. Um, I don't even know if this example works anymore. As I mentioned last time, it was done using a special theory cut down from Maine that didn't have lists in it. But it was done a while ago, and I'm not even sure it still works. If you do like lists, and maybe most do if we're computer scientists. The built-in list library is really immense, and I have to say somewhat disorganized and chaotic, but almost everything you've ever heard of as a function on lists is there, and lots of things you haven't heard of as well. Uh, you see it says a thousand theorems there, and it's probably more by now. So that is the built-in list library, but let's just pretend it's not there and imagine we're doing them uh, from the beginning. First of all, and I imagine this will be just a refresher for those of you who have done a course on um, discrete mathematics somewhere. We have the idea of structural induction over lists, which says if I'm trying to prove any particular property phi for all lists, and of course I'm talking about finite lists here, not lazy lists, you Haskell hackers. Um, you have to show two properties, namely that it holds for the empty list, which we call nil, and also that it holds for all non-empty lists built up by consing some x in front of an xs. And there we have an induction hypothesis, namely that uh, the property holds for a list that we're starting with, this list xs. And then we show that for every x that we stick in front of xs, the phi will still hold. If we can do those two things, then we have shown that phi holds for um, all lists. And of course, you've all seen that before, I hope. It's just like normal mathematical induction. Um, case analysis is a very similar thing, except we don't have an induction hypothesis. So we will be doing an example using this. And by the way, just to give you some basics again, I'm trying to kind of give you everything and then put all the pieces together and then we'll go through an example uh, and even do a little problem solving and trying to gear you up for the practical session you will have tomorrow. So this is what your JEdit window looks like. Now, it's a weird thing. JEdit, as I gather, was a Java editor written by a bunch of Java guys a long time ago and then possibly abandoned or something, as happens with open source projects. And then Makarius Wenzel, our guru, kind of picked it up and said, I can build a GUI on top of this. So we now have our own version of JEdit, which has you know, got Isabel installed in it, and this is what it looks like. It's a fairly general text editor. Um, when you open your Isabel session and you get a window like this, you will see these panels. Um, in fact, you don't there's not only the ones you can see, there's other ones you can dig out of a menu somewhere. But I think these are the built-in ones, and it keeps changing with new releases, and I'm often a little too lazy to update the slide. So I believe that find has now is now called search or something like that, but whatever, big deal. 
Um, so you have these panels, as you can see, on the sides and at the bottom. In fact, you can also stick them on the left side, though nobody seems to. Uh, so if you click on the documentation panel, a little thing slides out, and there's like a, a half a dozen manuals you can download. Um, the sidekick panel is useful if you have a very big theory. It gives you a kind of overall structure of the whole thing, and it's very good for navigating when you've got 10,000 lines. Um, the theory panel shows you a big theory hierarchy, assuming you've got one. So if, you are, if you've got a um, hundred theories loaded, which happens, you can see them all, and you can even see the state at which they all are, because they might be being loaded as you watch, which is actually kind of cool. Um, at the bottom, one of the most important things is the output window, which shows you what you're doing. In fact, this is so outdated, it's kind of a shame. I should probably show you the state window, and I don't have it here. But whatever, we will get to that later. Um, what we are doing now is going to do a little proof using this JEdit window that we have just seen. So here we have our theory, which is called demo list. And you can see we define a data type of lists using a fairly obvious looking data type definition. So a list is either nil or it's const with a, you know, the head of the list and the tail of the list. The next thing is defining the append function. Oh, I hope you've all had a little course on functional programming and you know how to append one list to another by doing the, the usual recursion. Um, and then we have a teeny tiny proof. So what are we proving there? I, we're simply proving that if I have a list and I append it to the empty list, then I get back what I started with. Pretty obvious, right? But you have to prove it. And what we've done here so that red rectangle is the cursor, and if you stick the cursor in any particular place, um, Isabel will show you the situation at that place. And by the way, here is a more up-to-date um, JEdit window. So the ones you saw in the previous slides were outdated, but here we have the state panel, which is the new way of seeing what your proof state is. Um, and here, this used to be find, and now it's called query. Um, so at that exact moment where the cursor is, uh, which is just after the induction, I had just put in a goal, which is something involving the variable x, which is a list variable. I now say induct on x, and the state then at this exact moment is shown there in the states panel. And it says, well, there are two things you've got to prove. And those two things are exactly the two things I showed you in the abstract on a previous slide. So there you can see that the variable excess in the thing we're trying to prove has been replaced in the first subgoal by nil and in the second subgoal by a thing that has cons. And moreover, you can see there is an induction hypothesis here. This is the assumption that, well, it's a thing we're trying to prove, but fixed to a, a particular um, variable excess. How do you prove this? Luckily, this one is easy. We just use auto. And you will find, and actually it's a slight problem with the exercises in this course, I only know two kinds of exercises, the trivial ones and the impossible ones. So the trivial ones are proved by auto, or more likely, induction on something followed by auto. The impossible ones are proved by a very big elaborate script that goes on for 20 or 30 lines. And I have to say, I have looked, um, and I really find the ones in between kind of difficult to find. But we will, in this, in this is the very lecture, we will see an example of problem solving where although at the end everything is trivial in this way, but you have to do a little work to get there. Uh, this, by the way, you need the keyword done to end your proof.
the once you put in done, that particular lemma is proved. Okay, let's look at another function and another proof attempt. So rev reverses a list. Again, this is the classic definition of list reverse, which I hope you've all seen in a functional programming course a long time ago. Um, so a nil is reversed to itself, and if you have a cons, you use the append function to stick the head of the list at the very end. And we're trying to prove something that should be trivial, which is if I take a list and reverse it, and then reverse it again, I get back to the list I started with. So, um, sorry there, let's go through my nice builds. That is the function. Now we do the induction. And as before, the induction replaces the induction variable by nil in the first case and by um, cons in the second case. And now we want to do uh, uh, apply auto and see what we get. Uh, and you can see that the word done is underlined, which meant, are you kidding me, it says, you say you're done, but you are not done, and I'm not letting you do this. Um, so why? What exactly is wrong here? If we look in the state panel, we see that what has been left after the auto, and by the way, auto, you, it auto tries to prove all your sub goals at the same time, and it gives you whatever it couldn't figure out. So in this case, it couldn't figure this out. Um, this is something it doesn't know how to prove. And your whole success, at whether you manage to solve problems or not, is how you deal with these things that it can't prove. Um, so what is going on here? We have reverse append reverse something something, and the interesting pattern here is reverse applied to append, right? As it says here, because we don't have any information at the moment about how you could simplify an expression with rev on the outside and inside a list of two things appended together. Now, it turns out there's a kind of obvious lemma you could try to prove. So look at this lemma there. You see the statement, reverse of append of two lists, xs and yf, equals the append of reverse yf, reverse xs, right? You just push the reverse through and swap the arguments around. I hope that's an obvious enough thing that we could try to prove. Now, when we try and prove this, um, we get an error again. You see, done is again underlined. Um, and why? Well, you see, what have we got here? We've got something that's kind of messy. If you look at this, uh, and yeah, it's not a good idea, actually, when you're sitting in a lecture to look in detail at all the symbols on the slide unless you want to fall asleep. But if one does look very closely, you can see, oh, what the hell? You can see what the problem is. See where that box is? We have that and that, that and that. So this thing and this thing are being rearranged. So you see, we need one last lemma, which is this lemma here at the top there, which is simply the associativity of list concatenation. So once we know, uh, and you can see how it's expressed using the, the nesting of app can either go to the left or to the right, and this theorem says it doesn't matter, either way you get the same result. Once you prove that lemma, which is in fact, proved by inductor and auto, you can see it's proved simply because there's no red underline in there. Once you prove that lemma, it will be able to prove the next lemma and the next lemma. Um, there's quite a big thing I forgot to tell you about. Um, 
Do I have a, a laser pointer that works? I yeah, probably don't, but let me try. Oh, I do. Do you see there where we have the word simp in square brackets? OK. Um, what that means is, so Isabel has a thing called a simplifier, which we look at in more detail next time. Um, the point of the simplifier is to use known facts, and in particular, known identities, to simplify things that you're trying to prove. Now, this simplification doesn't just happen any old time. You have to ask for it by typing auto or some other things like simp. Um, and when you do that, then it will use all this knowledge to simplify whatever you're working on. So when I put this keyword simp in here, again, right, right there, what I'm saying is, whenever you see the function app nested as it's shown on the left side, replace it by app as it is shown on the right side. If the simplifier will do that, then the proof that, remember, failed on the previous slide will now be successful because it will do that missing step and we will be done. And now exactly the same thing with this other lemma, so this one about reverse distributing over append. This has the exact same simp symbol there, which again means it's being given to the simplifier. Um, and that then will help the lemma that came after. So that when we look at the final proof, so there we are. So as I said, everything seems to be induct followed by auto, but it's not quite as trivial as that looks because I started by trying to prove the last one, and we couldn't, and then we realized we needed these two lemmas up in front. Now, I've done a quite bad thing here, which you mustn't imitate. Uh, normally, you would do the thing with names. So, in fact, you see the last one is called Rev Rev. That is simply the name of the lemma, and I can refer to it later. Um, the ones above, I was too lazy to think of a name for them, and I just stuck simp there. You should never do this because, for God's sake, you prove this thing, and if it doesn't have a name, you literally have no means whatever of referring to it. Okay, the simplifier knows about it and can use it, but you are, are actually deprived yourself of the ability to use it directly. So, of course, you should give all of those, those lemmas names. Um, another thing, actually, is one should be a little careful about using this simp keyword that I've shown you. You see, when I have done that, like there at the top, the one about append associativity of append, when I put it in like that, that ensures that whenever we do a simplification, all our appends will be associated to the right. Now, maybe that's a good idea, but I think it's not obvious that it's a good idea. Where we really should put in simp is actually where I didn't, so the very last one. I can't think of any reason on earth why rev of rev of something would be better than just that thing all by itself. So in fact, in a normal theory development, you would probably insert simp here, even if you're not aware of an immediate use for that fact, simply because it's such an obvious simplification to do. So you'll find, if you ever do a big development, that getting your default simplification right is really quite a tricky thing. Um, it's very easy to put in, and a lot of, I think, beginners make everything a simplification rule simply because they can, but then sometimes the result of this, you simplify and you get a thing that makes no sense at all because it's done all kinds of things that really were not appropriate in general. But that wouldn't happen with this. You see, this is just throwing stuff away, the last one I mean, rev rev of excess. That simplification rule is simply throwing away stuff it's not duplicating stuff, it's not rearranging stuff, and it's a totally safe thing to do. Okay, that's it for today. Any questions? Yes? So if you, um, if you don't want to market a simp, then will your simplifier be able to use it to 
Uh, yes, I've been keeping it simple by just calling auto, but you can give auto arguments, mm -hmm. and then you can give it whatever you want, and that is the normal way of doing things. Right, Another question? Ah, uh, yes, I have to go way back and then see what I Yes, these are precedences. And that's a very good question, because you can be lazy and leave all the numbers out. But if you do that, you're making a massively um, ambiguous grammar, and the early parser will struggle and probably find a thousand parses of whatever you've typed in. And if you're very lucky, only one of them will be typed correct, and then it will use it. But it will, will give you a kind of angry error at the same time, um, a warning at the same time. Um, there's dis a description in the documentation, which I believe is using the word mix-fix, M-I-X-F-I-X, mix-fix declarations, in which it's described in detail. But generally speaking, I think these precedences can go between zero, yeah, zero and a thousand. Um, I think we seldom go above a hundred, actually, except you need a thousand for, God, I can't remember. Um, if you leave things blank, so in the case of the if-then-else here, you'll see that only one precedence is given. And that's because, in fact, I don't think this is quite right. You see, between the if and the then, it's got brackets on both sides, so the precedence is irrelevant. That is, whatever inside is fully bracketed, so that's fine. Between the then and the else, that's also fine. The else sticking off the end, you do need to know to what extent that grabs stuff that comes after it, you know, with a high precedence, which means, I guess, the brackets go inwards, or with a low precedence, which means it's grabbing stuff further away. Uh, and I think there should actually be a number in front of that 60 in square bracket that would give the precedence of the last one. So I think this is a bit dodgy. I should go up a line to the semicolon. This looks that also looks weird, actually. <laughs> Why is that a 10? That's a very good question. I think, actually, these precedences are badly screwed up. Because normally, <coughs> ah, the thing about 10, maybe because semicolon is already built into the syntax, and I think, actually, you're, using, you're asking for trouble if you use something as important as semicolon, which is part of the very basic syntax of Isabel and if you redefine it for yourself, and the early parser will do its best and try and make sense of all these uses, but you are asking for trouble. Um, normally, a thing like the semicolon would have the same precedences on both sides and for the whole thing, that is 60, 60, 60, or maybe 60, 61 in bracket 60. Um, that would give you a left or right associativity. Uh, having 10 there looks weird. So. And yes, the first one also looks a bit weird. Yeah, I feel, I hadn't noticed how bad these were. I'm awfully sorry about this. The first one should be using the thing called infix in which that would set them up properly. Yeah, I need to fix these for next year, I think. Okay, anything else? Okay, if not, I'll see you all here tomorrow.